Divine Truth Discussions, informal group and individual discussions with Jesus and Mary about various topics and issues. The topic of this discussion is Law of Attraction, presented by Jesus on the 22nd of December 2007 in Dallas, Texas, USA. This is session one. I would like to uh, know about um, with regard to the spirit world or here or your own emotional work or those kind of things before I go and choose a subject for you. Mm. 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 <laughs> well, what I was going to do today is raise, this, raise the subject of the law of attraction. You heard of that law? Yes. You heard of the secret and all of those kind of things? Yes. All right. So, what I was going to talk about today is the truth about the law of attraction. And for those of you who haven't uh, haven't seen. So heard, heard me talk about things before. Do you all know that you are a soul, or a half of a soul actually, with a spirit body and a material body? It's Do you know that? Did you all know that? <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. And so when I'm talking about anything today, I'm not talking about who you are in your physical form, and I'm not talking about who you are in your spirit body form, but rather I'm talking about who you really are, the real you inside of you, what's inside of you. And if we can identify what the soul is when we're talking about it, it's your passions, your desires, your emotions, your feelings, your intentions, and etc. Right? All of those indeterminate things that are inside of you that you actually often may not think about. Right? But that's the real you. That's, and I say you're a half of a soul because you have a soul mate who's the other half of you. And that person also has all of these things inside of them as well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about the law of attraction, what I'm talking about is not focusing in particular on these two things. The mind of the spirit body and the brain of the material body. Right? Now, most people, when they think about the law of attraction, what they're thinking is that they can manifest things by thinking about it a lot. And when you think about it a lot, then everything will come about. Right? I know in the uh, secret, for example, there's a bit of... Uh, on one hand, they often talk about thinking about things, and on the other hand, they often talk about feeling about them, right? And there seems to be some contradiction between the two. What actually does cause you to attract the things you attract? So what I'd like to do is talk about what actually causes the things in, around your life to to be attracted to you. And what causes them is the soul. Right? So that's what causes them. Now, your soul has two sets of different types of emotions that are inside of it. There are errors inside of you and there's <coughs> truth inside of you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But it's inside of you, not in your mind, but rather in your feelings, in your emotions. Right? So here I'm not talking about anything to do with your thoughts, although these generate your thoughts. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what most people call the subconscious mind. Does that make sense? Which is really, in fact, your soul. And so what we want to do is focus on your soul. Now, what happens with... <coughs> Error is that you believe error to be truth. So right now, right inside of yourself, there's feelings that you have within you that you believe are true, but are actually false, from God's perspective. So if we look at our relationship with God, so here's God up there. God has absolute truth. So all of the truth of God is absolute and you are in a state of relative truth, so that means that there must be some errors within you. 
Does that make sense? And there must be, and they are emotional errors. They are emotions within you that cause you to feel things are true when they are not true. Now, perhaps I can give you an example. Let's say when I was young, I was treated badly by my, by my parents. Right? So I have a feeling with inside, of, inside of me right, of unworthiness. I'm unworthy to be treated well, let's say. So right when I was young, this feeling got inside of me. Now, you can think yourself out of that as much as you want. You can go for a jog along the road and say, I am worthy, I am worthy, and you can do all of that kind of stuff, right? But in the end of the day, if you have a feeling of unworthiness within you, so let's say it's a feeling, and the feeling is unworthy, then what it is like is this soul now is like this transmitter, if you like, that's transmitting to everyone around you, I am unworthy, I am unworthy, I am unworthy, right? And that's getting transmitted to every single person that you ever interact with, whether you open your mouth or not. Follow me? So it doesn't matter what you think about. I can go along jogging and try to train my mind to think that I'm worthy, but in the end, if I'm unworthy, and I feel unworthy inside of me, that's my belief system inside and emotion within me, then I'm going to transmit that to every single person I see. Now let's say I'm a woman who's doing that. I'm transmitting this unworthiness, right? Right from a young age I started transmitting it. What kind of people am I going to attract? Well, I'm going to attract a long line of people who are willing to treat me unworthily. Does that make sense? So if I'm seeing, this is the law of attraction at work, if I'm seeing that everyone around me is treating me unworthily, even if I think I'm good and I think good thoughts about myself, the truth is actually quite different. The truth is what the law of attraction gives you is in fact what you feel inside of your soul. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and that's a major, major truth in terms of your progression. And this applies, of course, to spirits as well as people on earth, right? What you see around you and what is created around you is in fact your true soul condition. Not what you think it should be or how you think it all should be inside of yourself or positive thoughts inside of yourself. <coughs> Don't create your reality. What creates your reality is the feeling within the soul. Does that make sense? Right. So, the law of attraction is going to expose your feelings. <laughs> what do we normally do when we have a feeling exposed? Like, let's say it's a feeling of fear. Let's say you're driving along in the road and all of a sudden somebody cuts you off and you almost have an accident. What's the feeling that you have at that time? Anger. Fear and anger? Fear and anger? Okay. So let's write those down. Fear and anger. Now, what do most people do with those two feelings? Suppress them. Compact. Suppress them. Okay, so that's one choice, isn't it? To suppress. Act it out. Or to or to act it. And what's the third alternative? To feel it. To feel it. In a sense, without acting and without suppressing. To right. so protect it someone else. Sorry. Protect it feeling to someone else, maybe. Yeah, well, that's right. That's really what acting it is. I can even, as soon as I project it, I can even just sit there and swear my head off at the other person who just went past me, right? Or just cut me off. That is projecting my fear and anger straight onto someone else. Does that make sense? Now, the way God created the law of attraction was that if you do this, suppress, or you do this, act it out, you will never actually release the error. Follow me? Say that again. If you suppress an emotion, okay. or you act out the emotion, in other words, project it onto somebody else, mm -hmm. you will never you ever know. release. So you got it. <clears throat> you know. you you'll have it within you, and you'll never deal you with it. Tell you I did this or this, but it's still here. That's still inside. Does that make sense? While it's still inside, it's going to be in your soul, and that will determine your spiritual condition. Yeah. Now, this is why a lot of spirits are confused when they pass over, right? Because 
they actually believe that they can somehow suppress their emotions and grow spiritually, or that they somehow can act out their emotions and grow spiritually. But the truth is, they need to choose to feel their emotions without doing both of those other two things. you follow me? And the truth is that that's what we need to do as well. So, let's come up with some examples of what's going on in the Lord of Traction. First one is, imagine that I'm a guy in the corner, and over the other corner there's a, there's a girl that I like. That I just I see her, and she looks good to me, and I want to uh, I want to catch up with her, and I at least want to talk to her. Let's say. So right at that moment, there's a feeling in me, and the feeling is to go towards that girl, huh? to actually to actually make steps towards talking to her. But let's say I have a feeling of unworthy inside of me. I make a step towards her, and what's going to happen now? I start getting scared, because what do I feel inside of me? I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy about talking with her. Does that make sense? Now, is my desire now pure to talk with her? No. Now, there's a pretty good chance that I'll withdraw from that transaction. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean withdraw from actually going and, and, and speaking with her because of that particular feeling that's in me. So I sit down about it and I say, nobody wants me. No girl ever takes any notice of me. Right? What's actually happening is my feelings of unworthiness are being projected to everyone. And the only girl that's ever going to be attracted to me is a girl who treats me unworthily. That's the only one that's going to be attracted to me. Because none of the others will find me attractive. Okay. Alright, let's go in a different example. Let's say we're a, an adult... Um, sure. But you said if you had a desire, you saw her, you take the step. Yep. But then your unworthiness kicks in, your desire is no longer pure. That's right, but every time, every time a desire of truth Every time a desire of truth or in, in harmony with love is within me, at that moment I am pure, if you like. But every time I let a, des a desire of error or a feeling of error interfere, I am now going to be in a state of impurity. Does that make sense? This applies to all of our longings and all of our <coughs> feelings within us. Yeah? So at that moment I'll be in a state of error emotionally. In other words, I will let the emotion of error dominate me. Right? And the emotion of error will dominate you whether you think it's dominating you or not. Does that make sense? So you can even you can even force yourself to go and talk to that lady, but there's a pretty good chance if you have unworthy, and it's high likelihood, if you have unworthy within your soul, and you actually force yourself intellectually to go and talk with the lady, What's going to be the result? In the end, she will probably reject you unless she is going to treat you unworthily. <laughs> Don't bother. <laughs> so while I have a feeling in me that causes me to feel this emotion, everything around me will attract that. Everything around me. This is why a lot of, a lot of people think, well, I tried hard to do this and I tried hard to do that, but it still didn't work. Why not? Because we can try all we want, but if the feeling is in the soul, that is what you will definitely get. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You will definitely get that feeling, that, that action towards you, no matter what. Children are a great reflector, actually, of your actual attitude. So let's say, inside of myself, I'm an adult, let's say, and inside of myself I have a feeling that I, I feel like I'm disrespected all the time, right? That's the feeling in my soul. Right? What's going to happen is everyone around me will sooner or later treat me disrespectfully, <coughs> including my own children. So what do we often do? We then tell our children off, you know, you shouldn't be treating you should be treating me respectfully, <laughs> and so forth and so forth. But we're not seeing the truth, and that is the feeling within our soul is being perfectly triggered through the law of attraction. We have this feeling within us. And so we are going to 
Basically, you're going to encourage, through your emotions, everyone to treat you disrespectfully. Does that make sense? That's what's going to happen. And it doesn't matter how hard you intellectually use your mind to try and get out of that situation. Inside of yourself, the soul is far more powerful than anything you can do in your mind. And if the emotion is within you, in your soul, then that is what you will get every single time. So you think of a lady, for example, who's grown up feeling like she is unworthy. Often what she'll do is <coughs> the first man who comes along will treat her unworthily, right? So let's say the first man who comes along treats her, abuses her. And this will come from a childhood thing. Let's say, let's say, let's say we're talking about a woman, and let's say her dad, her father, treated her abusively. Right? When I say abusively, I'm not talking about sexual abuse here, I'm just saying that he treated her as though she was not worth anything. He often hit her or he often spoke to her in a way that put her down. What's the feeling that's going to be in her soul? Unworthy. Unworthy? Mm -hmm. What's the unworthy feeling going to create? The first relationship she has, what's going to happen? She's going to attract a guy. She might even just be a teenager, right? And the first thing she will do is attract a guy who treats her unworthily. Now, the first guy might not be so bad, but he still treats her unworthily and the unworthy feelings within her grow, right? What's the next guy going to be like? Worse. Worse. Right? He's going to maybe even be abusive towards her. Right? Why is she attracting this? So that she can start to deal with this emotion of unworthy. But what do we normally do? We suppress or act out the emotion rather than feeling it. Right? And this is the problem. The law of attraction is there to expose our emotional condition. Does that make sense? The law of attraction is there to help you deal with the emotion you are yet to release from you. And this happens perfectly in every case. So, let's go back to our driving along in the car thing situation. <coughs> driving along in the car, we get cut off. We feel afraid. What do we need to do? Feel it. Just feel the fright. Let yourself feel that fear because that fear is being triggered. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The fear is being triggered because there's an emotion in the soul of fear. And you will attract events that cause you to be afraid while that emotion of fear is in your soul. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's very powerful when you think about it because it's about taking complete emotional responsibility. Right? So in other words... Instead of saying, it was her fault she did that, or it was his fault he did that, or something happened and it was him that did that, what we would, what we would need to do if we understood the law of attraction properly is we'd need to start saying to ourselves, what within me caused me to attract that particular thing? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And if you have that focus on every single thing that's created around it. Let's say, let's say we don't have much money. Right? So let's say we're not having much money in our life. In other words, we're not having enough to make things meet. What emotion is being triggered? What do you feel like when you don't have much money? I'm afraid. Feel afraid? Okay. What kind of feelings would you have? Do you when you don't have much money, there's a bill that rocks up on your doorstep today and you've got no money to pay it and you know in the next month you're not going to get any money to pay it and you know if you don't pay it, you're going to get in trouble. What's the emotion? Helplessness. Helpless? Okay. What else? Insecurity. Insecurity? Could it be undeserving? Could it be undeserving, yeah. Now, these are sort of core type emotions. What a lot of people do instead is they feel angry, or they get upset, and they get frustrated, right? Which is all really anger. All of that is doing is covering over these emotions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's all it's doing. So, with the law of attraction, the law of attraction is perfectly happening to expose your true emotional condition. But the problem is this. 
the problem is that most of us, instead of thinking that, that everything's happening perfectly to expose our motion condition, uh, instead of thinking that, what we'll do is, here is our emotional condition, so we'll call that our emotional condition. And what we do around it is we build this castle, right? There's this big wall around our emotional condition. And you could, you could call it a castle. Looking down from the top, here's the ramparts, and here's the gate and the castle, and we have a moat going around the outside, right? The guards. The bars and everything else that we can do, right? That's what we do, right? What are we trying to do? Most of the time, we're trying to protect our current emotional condition. What's God trying to do most of the time? Yeah, expose. 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 expose that emotional condition. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if we put up all the barriers and we put up the walls and we shut everything down and we close everything off, what we're actually doing is the opposite to what God would like us to do, and that is connect with ourselves emotionally. So what we do, you imagine there's a great marauding army coming in this direction, right? So there's an army coming up there, right? What would most people be tempted to do when they're getting attacked? Fight back, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Defend, in other words. So what do you do when your emotions are ex when your emotions are exposed? Attack. <laughs> Defend. Go on the offense, maybe. Fight. Run away. Could run away. <laughs> You could run away, yeah. you could run away right? Still, still trying to, so you could uh, clear out altogether. <laughs> but what is God trying to achieve in all of these laws? All of these laws are there to expose your emotional condition, right? So I know it doesn't make much sense, like in a in a war situation. But what we need to do is, in fact, <laughs> open the gates, close down the moat, and let the army just come barging through. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's what we need to do. We need to let all of those emotions that are going to be triggered and let every single person in our life who's going to trigger them, trigger them. But most of the time what we do is avoid the situation. For example, let's say I've got a mother-in-law who always gets on my go. Right? Every time she comes around, I've got a problem. Every time I have these constant transactions with her where I'm upset and she keeps coming around and doing the same thing over and over. What's happening? What's happening is I've got this army, which you can think of your mum and Laura as, but that's what you know, and this army is coming to you because your soul needs to have certain emotions. Let's call it triggered, right? How are you going to ever release these emotions if nobody triggers them? You're not going to write it when you think about it. How many people dive into their emotions without any external trigger? Most of the time, we don't even know the emotions there until they're triggered, right? Mm. Right. So let's say the mother-in-law is the trigger. So we call it mother-in-law. Military, yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 right. So this mother-in-law comes in and wants to attack your castle. That's what she's doing. Really, she's attacking your emotional castle, isn't she? So what do you do? <coughs> do you run and hide? Make sure you're never there when mum and all comes. <laughs> uh, a lot of people do that, don't they? Yeah. They just stay away from the person who's causing the trigger. Right? What, what other people do? Go on the attack just as much as your attack. Right? Go on the go on the offense. Or go on the defense. No, that's not what I mean. You know, you're going through this process of trying to reason with mum and all, when in reality. All that needs to happen is let yourself feel your emotional condition. What does she make you feel? Let's say she makes you feel like you're unwanted. Right? So she comes and talks to, you, to your wife and doesn't even speak with you. How does that feel? Let yourself go there. How, how is she treating you? Is she treating you like you're worth anything? No, let yourself go there. Does that make sense? Instead of trying to avoid, instead of trying to have, put the castle up. I have a question. Yeah. So if you work through that, will she come back? <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty. Right? Yeah, is that know. once you deal with the unwanted, she will not be able to treat you as if you're unwanted anymore. There will be an automatic change in her, no matter what her condition. 
there'll be an automatic change in her and she won't be able to treat you that. She'll either stay away or she'll come and treat you better. Does that make sense? Mm. Once you make the change within yourself emotionally, <clears throat> yeah, so that's the power of the law of attraction. Then you don't really have to address her at all. You, you just... You don't have to address it at all. Just give you another example. There's a there was a, a young la lady who has who has uh, three children in Australia. We were talking about the emotional triggers, and she put up her hand and said, "Look, I've got my three boys, and I've noticed that every time they turn four years of age, or three years of age, sorry, it was, and they all get angry with me, and they stay angry with me for the rest of their life." <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen-year-old and an eight-year-old and, and a four-year-old, four and as soon as they became three, she noticed that every single one of them got angry with her. What would you be tempted to do? What she was saying was, "Just my boys don't like me." That's what she was saying. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do you know what was actually happening? When she was three, when she was three. She was abused by, sexually abused by, by a fellow, an old fellow. And whenever the boys turned three, it reminded her of that abuse and her feelings of dislike towards men. Does that make sense? And she began projecting feelings of dislike towards, without understanding what was going on within herself, she began feel, projecting feelings of dislike towards men. And as a result, they got angry with her because it's unfair for them, right? Mm -hmm. So they got angry with her automatically. What happened was, once she realised that, she cried and cried for about a, about a month, around about a month. Um, her name's Tara, this lady, and she cried over and over about this abuse issue that occurred. A month, about two months later, she came back and said, all of my boys treat me really good now. And she never even addressed the issue with any of them. The only boy that treat, still has a feeling of anger towards her and nowhere near as strong as it was, was her oldest boy who was 15, because obviously by now he's also making decisions within himself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but the two youngest began to treat her good straight away as soon as she dealt with that emotion. So why? Because the emotion was out of her. She was no longer going, going... Boys are bad, boys are bad, men are bad. Right? And if you think about it, if you're sending out this signal from your soul that men are bad, who's going to be mostly affected by it? Your sons. Does that make sense? If you're a woman and you're sending out that emotion, it's your sons that are going to be affected mostly by that. And they're going to perfectly reflect that emotion back at you to trigger the emotion within you. Does that make sense? To allow yourself to deal with it through the law of attraction. <coughs> And that's what she found. As soon as she changed, as soon as she changed her emotional condition, remember this is your soul. As soon as she changed her soul, straight away, she found that straight away she was no longer sending out these feelings from her soul. Right? And the boys in her house were the first ones to notice it. And that's the law of attraction at work. She didn't talk with them at all. In fact, I recommended to her to not talk with them at all about the issue. Because every time you go to talk to somebody, what you're really doing is blaming them, isn't it? In a way. So let's say if she'd sat down with the boys and said, oh, you know, have you noticed you've been treating mummy really badly lately? And, and off you go along that line, right? What happens there? What are you now putting on them? Guilt. Guilt. So now not only do they feel angry and upset and unjust, you're being unjust, but now on top of that, they feel they're being blamed as well for what you feel. Right? So with her, I just said, it just recommended to her not to talk at all with the boys about anything that they've done and just to work on her own emotional condition. And when she did, all of a sudden they treated her differently. And this is what you will notice happening. When you have an emotion within your soul, you will attract trigger after trigger after trigger after trigger. When you release the emotion from your soul, you will stop attracting these triggers. Does that make sense? That's how simple it is. How, how do you release it though? Because what I hear you saying is that you just have to feel the emotion, but 
mean, have you... Have you actually released it? How do you release it? Okay. Because the key is not to act out, it's just to release it, right? And just to back off and be, I guess, be by yourself and just release it. Um, yes, some, you don't have to be by yourself, but often it can be helpful. <coughs> Let's look at, though, when a motion is released, what actually happens, right? And then we'll talk about some things to do with resonance and protection as to what happens. Firstly, with regard to release, this is what, this is what happens. There are two sorts of emotions. There are causal type emotions and there are effect type emotions. So you know when you're driving along in the car and somebody cuts you off and there's that instant anger? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's an effect emotion. So let's say the effect emotion is anger. <coughs> what do you think the causal emotion might be? Disrespect. The feeling inside of you that they didn't they disrespected mm -hmm. you. Okay. So the feeling inside of disrespect. I'm disrespected, let's say, let's call it that. Any others? Unlucky. Um, I'm unlucky? Yeah, if you were yep. in you know, the wrong place at the wrong time, figure out. Oh, okay, yep. I'm lucky. Me, yep. In other words, I'm condemned to fail or I'm mm -hmm. condemned to yeah. be harmed, no matter what I do. It's going to happen to somebody. It's going to happen to somebody, it's going to happen to me. Is that kind of feeling? Yeah. So what's that? you fatalistic, isn't it? Is it fatalism? So we could have a feeling of fatalism. Anything else? Uh, uh, what about someone taking advantage of you, feeling like someone is... Okay, so what do you feel like when you're being taken advantage of? A victim. A victim? What else might it be? This gives us a few to work with. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Now these are all causes of this event. The event, the law of attraction was that this event occurred and the effect of the event even, the event itself is actually an effect. Right. So I'll just, I'll just write that down. Events are effects. Does that make sense? So every event that happens to you is an effect of something else, something that's going on within. And I'm, and I'm saying good things too, right? When good things happen to you, that's the effect of something inside of your soul too. Not just bad things, not just things that are negative or emotionally negative. So there's an event that occurs. I respond in anger. If I respond in anger, then I'm actually denying these causal emotions. Now, I can even go down the track of crying. Let's say I respond in anger and I, get, I pull over on the side of the road and I'm also afraid, right? And eventually I have a bit of a breakdown and I have a few tears come. What am I really crying about? Most of the time about the event. Does that make sense? I'm not, it's only when I actually deal with these emotions that the causes are released. And it's feeling those emotions that is needed if you want to release an emotion. Does that make sense? You need to feel the emotions that are based around causes, not effects. Now give another example. Let's say, I, let's say I was a lady who was married to a, a man who's abusing right? them. Every single day there's a very good chance I'll cry about his abuse. Right? What am I crying about? What happened like that day that he abused you? What happened that day, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So I'm crying about the effects of something inside of my soul. What do I really need to do? About why you being abused. Yeah. What inside of me causes me to attract this abuse? Does that make sense? And I need to go there and actually start crying about that. Well, it kind of gave me from the facts of causes, like, because then you don't always know why things upset you, like, what emotions are. Um, you may not always know why, but you certainly usually always know the emotion. And that's the beauty of the law of attraction. Does that make sense? Most of the time you may not know that when you were three years old, this particular event occurred to you, and so 
that's what caused you to feel like you're a victim. Yeah. But when you let yourself cry about the feeling of being a victim, what will pop into your mind in many cases is the event that caused it. Does that make sense? That's what often happens. And all of you who have done some emotional work know that oftentimes you don't have a memory until you feel the cause of emotion. Until you just let yourself feel the emotion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you can cry about effects all of your life and still not actually deal with the cause of emotion. But usually all causal based emotions are generally related to childhood issues. And oftentimes it's not until you start feeling some of these core issues that you start releasing the causes that cause the effect. Now, the key, the key thing to bear in mind is, if the emotion inside of you isn't released yet, you will attract another event. Does that make sense? So it's really simple to tell whether you've dealt with something completely. <laughs> the truth is, if, if you've dealt with it completely, you will not attract the same event anymore. So if your same event's getting attracted every single time, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that you have yet to find the cause. And to be honest, most of the time we don't want to find the cause, that's why we haven't <coughs> found it yet. Why don't we want to find the cause? Because sometimes the causes are pa firstly painful. Secondly, a lot of times the causes are related to an emotion or something inside of ourselves that we, we're trying to avoid. Pain. And usually, if, because of pain, we're trying to avoid these things. <coughs> so usually what finishes up doing, if the cause is pleasurable, then we'll say, yeah, I'll own that one. <laughs> <laughs> if the cause is painful, we say, no, that's somebody else's. It must be Tom's, I reckon. <laughs> he must have caused that, not me, right? Does that make sense? That's what we always do, generally, isn't it? We focus on, but when something's created in our lives that was sad or or upset or anger or any of those, what are we normally doing? We're normally saying it was their fault, it was their fault, it was their fault. And not saying the law of attraction is perfectly at work here and it must be something within me. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So, what do we do when an event comes up? Here I'll talk about two types of things that we generally do. The first thing that we usually do with any event that comes up is we resonate with it emotionally. For instance, when the guy is driving along and he's cut me off, my reaction of anger is actually a resonance of a deeper emotion. In other words, there's something happening within me that causes me to resonate with that event. Does that make sense? Something inside of me, nothing, nowhere else inside of me. What do I do with that resonation of that event? Or what do I do when I feel that emotion? Well, usually what we finish up doing is projecting it. Right? We do that in one or two ways. One or two or three ways. Yeah. Anger is always a projection. Now, it could be even anger with self, but it's still a projection. Does that make sense? We may withdraw. Withdraw. Not withdraw. Withdraw. That is also a projection. Does that make sense? What we're trying to do, the other person is say, no, 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 no. Don't you do this to me anymore. Don't you do this to me anymore. Does that make sense? So when we withdraw, we're basically saying to the other person, don't do this to me anymore. Don't, don't do this. When we get angry, what we're saying, don't do this and I'll make you stop. <laughs> huh? When we do this, we're saying, don't do this and I'm going to go into my shell. Huh? Or we often do a third thing, and that is we, um, we make out we're loving. Huh? So in other words, uh, let's say we're resonating with an emotion of sadness within us. So let's say inside of ourselves we feel sad. Right? If we don't project anger and we don't withdraw, sometimes what we'll do is 
will go and try to make the person who made us resonate with their sadness, make them happy. Or make ourselves happy. Does that make sense? Do something loving for myself so I feel happy. Or do something loving to the other person so they feel happy. So often we do so-called loving things which are not loving. Because love wouldn't do that. Love wouldn't turn off an emotion within yourself or someone else. That's a manipulation. We try to it is a manipulation, yeah. We often try to manipulate others by loving them. By loving them. Right. And in reality, what we're doing is damaging them, damaging them further and ourselves further. Because right? every time we project an emotion onto someone else, we are actually stopping our own resonance, and therefore we're stopping the effectiveness of the law of attraction to work in our behalf. Does that make sense? So you look very seriously at when you get angry, when you withdraw in particular, or when you're loving to people. Mm -hmm. Alright? Because a lot of times what we're doing is we're trying to turn off our own emotion and in an effort to do that we often are trying to shut down the other person. Yeah? Does that make sense? Sometimes it's so subtle because you feel like you're doing something loving but you're actually just covering up something that you feel like you need to please person, so how do you, how do you figure your trigger in that? You know, how do you trigger, how do you feel like, you know, get that trigger going to uh, have that realization that you're just doing it to please somebody rather than to, to actually do it because you love that person? Alright, let's say, um, here, here's one example. Let's say you seem to always attract people who need your help. Oh. Right? No one wants to help you, but you always seem to be there seems to be this long line-up of people who need your help. Does that make sense? What do you do? What, what's the issue? What's going on here? Well, there's a law of attraction at work, and you resonate with their desire to help. Otherwise, what would you do if they wanted help? And you would see, do they really need help, or are they just in that state where they're really, they're really to take anything that they can get. What, what is it that's driving you? What is it that's driving you, not them? Now, if you have a long list of people in front of you who need your help, and you're getting a bit upset about it, or you're finding that it's uh, pretty challenging emotionally for you to have this long line of people, and you're asking yourself, when am I going to get someone who helps me? What's going on? You're still not dealing with an emotion. The causal, remember we talked about causal emotion? You're not dealing with the cause of why you want to help everybody all the time. Does that make sense? Why do you want to take responsibility for their life all the time? And you're going to get a continual stream of people who you need to help. And if you don't deal with that cause, that will continue happening over and over and over again until you work through the cause of why you feel that way. What would be a cause of why you want to help people all the time? Alright, let's look at a cause of why I would want to help people all the time. Any ideas? Need to feel wanted and loved. Okay. Yeah. They help somebody, they say thank you, or you're so wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yes. So I'm looking for emotions of. Emotions of approval. Mm. Or I'm feeling loved, feel loved because I feel wanted. When I feel wanted, I feel loved. The two are not the same thing, are they? If somebody wants you, that doesn't mean they love you. But you may equate the feeling of being loved. Anything else? I feel useful. I've done something useful. Feel useful, yeah. So, so these are the emotions of what goes on when I do it. So what's going to go on when I don't do it? You will feel approved of. All right. So I'll feel unapproved. Unwanted. Unwanted. And useless. <laughs> and what am I avoiding? Those feelings. Does that make sense? 
So these are the feelings that I'm trying to get by my action. These are the feelings that are within me that I'm trying to avoid. Sometimes you feel guilty for not doing yeah. what they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So or can you see how the feelings that you're seeking also tell you the feelings that you're trying to avoid within yourself? Mm. Yeah. Now, what's going to happen is while you feel unapproved and unwanted and useless, you are going to have heaps of people come who will, who will trigger that emotion eventually. <coughs> so you imagine if you've got 25 people in front of you who all need you to do something for them, eventually what's going to happen is you're going to feel like nobody wants to do anything for you, right? And isn't that nobody wants to do things for me? Nobody. You see what's happening is that the events occur to trigger the true reason inside of yourself as to why you're doing something. Yeah. But isn't there even more layers to that? Like you have, then you need to get like each one saying, why am I unwanted? Why am I feeling that free? Definitely. And then you just go down the court. But be careful here <clears throat> because it's not the intellectual work that does anything. It's the emotional work that does it. Do you understand what I mean by that? So I can go down and actually find the reason why I feel so unwanted, and yet I can still not feel that at the feeling. And while I do that, I can keep getting this. And this is what happens often, most, most of the time, in fact, nowadays. A lot of people are aware, often, of the emotions that are inside of them, and often even are aware of their causes, but don't want to feel them. So how do you actually feel unwanted? How does it feel when you're unwanted? Let's say nobody in this world wants you. How would you feel? Sorry, I'm sad. Would you be there watching telly, do you think? <laughs> or do you think you'd be out uh, going to dinner tonight, if that's how you really <laughs> feel? <laughs> okay, what would you do instead? You would, wouldn't you be in the feeling? Wouldn't you be crying and being really, really upset that no one in the world wants you? Wouldn't you even perhaps even feel suicidal? They are the feelings you're avoiding. Does that make sense? They are the feelings that you're trying to get away from. You see, often what we do is we go there and we even see that this is the feeling we have, but we don't allow ourselves to experience what it means to be unwanted. And when we don't experience it, the causal emotion can't be released. Every emotion gets into us through an emotional experience. Does that make sense? Therefore, every emotion that's in us needs to come out of us through an emotional experience. We can't intellectualize ourselves out of these emotions. Yeah? If we try, what we'll do is we'll keep attracting the same events over and over again until <clears throat> we actually start allowing ourselves to feel the emotion. Now some of our emotions are so overwhelmingly powerfully negative mm -hmm. right, that we just do not allow ourselves to even touch it. And we'll do almost anything to get away from it. Right? And this is what I'd like to talk about, is the things that we do to get away. Right? Remember it's like a castle that we've built around our emotional condition, and what do we do to get away? Well, let's look at some external things we do. What are, what are some external things you do to get away from your emotions? Overeat. Overeat? Okay. Shop. Shop. Computer games. But like talking about it all, like what what so and so did to you all the time. Oh like, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, talking talking about it without feeling it. Yeah. 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 Drugs. Drugs. Yeah. So we can go down the alcohol line as well, can we? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if you spoke it right, you can. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting good. We're getting good. Music. Music. 
Now, you notice that a lot of these are really quite innocent, are they? Aren't they? Yeah. <coughs> so can you see that the external tools, we could call these the tools of denial, right? And can you see that a lot of them, denial in there, can you see that a lot of these tools of denial are actually quite innocent? That's why we choose them, you know. Mm. I'm not a drug addict, so I'm okay. <laughs> but you might be a TV addict, right? Mm. Or, or a prescription drug. Or a prescription mm. drug, or something mm. else, right? We often go down this track. Anything else, external? Mm. Sorry? Reading, Reading. yeah. Now, can you see, you can, you can do a lot of these things. Uh, what was that one? I said, oh, sleeping too much. Sleeping, yeah, sleeping. Yeah. Can visit with friends. <laughs> friends, yeah, so friends. You can see that a lot of these things are not wrong in themselves, right? In the sense that they're not going to damage you in themselves. It's what you're, and this is a word that you need to remember quite a lot, is what your intent is. Is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if your intent is to use music to run away from your emotions, who are you hurting? Yourself. So, if your intent is to use food to get away from emotions, who are you going to hurt? Yourself. Does that make sense? And by the way, you may hurt others around you as well whenever you have these intentions. For instance, most people who intend to use drugs to get away from their emotions generally harm a lot of people around them in the process. A lot of people who use alcohol to run away from emotions eventually create a whole family that's got huge problems because of their avoidance of their emotions. So if your intent is to avoid your emotions, you may choose some external things to do it. The key is to notice your intent when you're doing those things. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to get away? Are you trying to run away? Are you trying to avoid? Now they're a little easier to see sometimes, mm. but the internal things you do are usually a bit harder. To... What What are some internal things that you might do? Your reasoning, reasoning Yeah. <coughs> so what might you do when you're reasoning? You might firstly just minimise the problem, right? Min min minimise the problem. <laughs> minimise the problem. I'm not too connected today myself. So. Min <laughs> 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 Make smaller. <laughs> Why would I minimise it? I might say, like, so let's say today I got angry while I was driving the car. So then drive along, somebody cut me off, got angry. What would you do to minimise that? What would you say? Uh, it wasn't so bad. Yeah. yeah. Eh, just human. Just human. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that minimised it. That got rid of that. There and gone. You know. The whole opportunity is now gone. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You could justify it. Mm -hmm. So let's say you drive along in your car and you get cut off and you feel angry and you yell and scream at the other person or feel that the feel to do that. Yeah. What could you do to justify it? It's normal to get angry. Yeah, everyone gets angry. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he was he was he was doing a dangerous driving. He was driving dangerously. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you know, I can justify myself for getting angry now. Mm -hmm. And another thing we often do is shift responsibility or blame. So what would I do there? Drive along, get cut off, shift the responsibility. Blame me. It's for switching the radio. Okay, yeah. yeah. Blame the fact that I'm late for work. It's all work's fault, right? That I'm late for work. We could blame all sorts of things. Yeah. Every time we do this, we are choosing an internal way to run away. When we choose an internal way of running away, it's a bit more difficult because you can do this forever. Uh, you can run away forever. There are many spirits in the spirit world currently who are running away and have been running away for a thousand years from their emotion. Mm. Does that make sense? Many of them are still running away from their emotion. They're still in the first fear of the spirit world in what some, some would call the hells and dark places in the spirit world. And they are still running away because they <coughs> use all these methods. See, it's very hard for them to use all these methods when they're in the hills because there's no pretty place to go and visit. There's no, a lot of times the place where they're at is dark and dingy and, and quite sad, right? 
So they use all of these internal things. I'm here because Joe Blow put me here. I'm here because of that reaction with this person. I was talking to a, uh, a person who committed suicide uh, about a year or so ago, who's in the spirit world, and he was saying the whole reason why he's there was because of his mother. Mm -hmm. um, now, while that might be true, in the sense, in the sense that you know he decided to suicide because of how his mother treated him, she wasn't the whole reason why he was there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And he wanted to just shift the responsibility onto somebody else. When we do this, generally we also do all the other things like getting angry, right, mm -hmm. and and doing all of those other things too, because it. These are all internal methods that we use to run away. So the key is noticing when you're running away and using an internal or external tool of denial to do it and seeing that every time you do, you are trying to run away from the law of attraction. Do you reckon you can run away from any of God's laws? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You're never going to be able to run away from them. They will always have an effect. Every single one. So it's far better to start looking at what you're doing. I've talked to many people. Uh, we, we talked to, uh, when was it when we talked to those Catholic spirits? It was about two months ago, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. There was this group of Catholic spirits in the spirit world who were former popes. And uh, they were in the first sphere of the spirit world. Uh, and they were telling me that their actions, which were, they, they'd murdered millions of people for the sake of their faith. These men had, had gone through the process of murdering millions of people for the sake of their faith. So, you know, during the Spanish Inquisition and the Dark Ages, these were many of the spirits that we talked to were from that area. And they were telling me at the time that they were completely justified to do that. So they were justifying their actions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And they were going to stay in that current condition while they continued to justify their own actions. These, these people that you talked to, the one who committed suicide, these uh, popes and whoever, do they have the ability to grow from there? Is there anybody there teaching them? Yes. If they, that's if they chose to, to know this. That's so correct. someone is trying to help them. Someone's this, always trying to help, yeah. But they're not listening. Yeah. They're just stuck. They, they, yeah, but by choice. They're stuck by choice. They're choosing, just like a person on here, here on earth chooses to ignore what you're saying to them at some point, so too you can do the same on spirit world as well. We've had other groups of spirits, like we had a group of around 250 spirits who were Russian Orthodox spirits. The same night that these Catholic spirits came, these 250 Russian Orthodox spirits came to talk, and they were all willing to not justify themselves anymore. Mm -hmm. And they all progressed. They all started progressing from that night onwards. What? what? Oh, you I'm can. Sorry. You can help them. Anybody? Anybody can help them. Yeah. What made the difference between one group and the other group? <coughs> well, one group was willing to stop using internal yeah. tools of denial, denying what they had done. Mm. Right. So they were saying that this was a difference between the two groups. One spirit. One group of spirits, the Russian Orthodox spirits, were saying. We were sinners when we were on earth. We were doing all these bad things and they were all wrong. We see now that they were all wrong. So what were they doing? They weren't minimising themselves. They weren't justifying. They weren't putting the blame onto somebody else. They were taking full emotional responsibility for what they had done. Does that make sense? Yeah. When a person's in that state, you can help them. It doesn't matter whether they're here or in the spirit world. You can help them really easily. If, what makes them make that shift from denial to, to responsibility? Well, a lot of times in the spirit world, it's pain. Pain. It's just like normal. Just like normal. If it hurts enough, you finally quit. <laughs> exactly. And, and for okay. many, if it hurts enough, you quit. And this is the problem. is like, when does a person who eats too much stop eating? Yeah. When they're this big, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes. Does that make sense? That's when they stop eating. Why? Because the pain... The emotional and physical pain of being that large, they start seeing the truth, and that is I'm using food to run away. Does that make sense? So the thing is with all emotion, it's like this. Let's say we had some scales. Let's call this scale here the pain scale. And let's call this scale here the 
the error or fear scale. Does that make sense? And let's call this scale over here the love scale. What's the opposite of fear, do you think? No. Love. Love? Or does, does love have an opposite? No. Does love have an opposite? Hate. No, hate's not no. an opposite of love, actually. True. Hate's opposite. Well, wouldn't it be if the opposite of love would be no love, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's right. The absence <laughs> of love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not hate. Hate is actually fear being displayed. Mm -hmm. right? The opposite of fear generally is truth. Mm -hmm. So think of fear as false expectations appearing real, error appearing real, in other words. Right? In other words, you believe something to be true when it's actually not true. Think of fear as that. Think of pain. Well, you know what pain feels like, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Everyone that doesn't know what pain feels like. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine for a moment that your scale of fear about dealing with your emotions was a seven. And let's for a moment think that your pain is at a level five, let's say. In other words, your pain's not unbearable. You can handle it every day. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. But let's say you are so afraid to deal with anything in your life that you're unwilling to deal with your pain. What happens is, if the fear is greater than your pain, you will not deal with your emotion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Can you see why? Because you're too afraid to. You're more afraid of your fear than you are of your pain. Exactly. Exactly. What happens when this happens, though? All of a sudden, over time, and because of the choices you're making to avoid, all of a sudden the pain gets up here. What are you going to do now? You start dealing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's the same in the spirit world. In the spirit world, this is the same reason why they deal with different things in the spirit world, is because generally it's because the pain just gets too great. Right? Just like it does here. The pain gets too great, so you start dealing. The key is to have a zero tolerance for pain. In other words, the key is to... How much pain does it take before you deal with anything? None. <laughs> That's where you need to be. Does that make sense? That's where you no, go... That would oh, simplify life a lot. Because what happens is that, oftentimes what happens is that we let the pain get greater and greater and it's like a pressure cooker inside of us. The pressure gets greater and greater and greater and greater and greater. And what's the little valve on the top do? Just lets off a bit of steam. But does it ever let go of all the pressure? Well, often not, right? So what happens is the pressure builds up and up and up and up again. What happens? It lets off a bit of steam. So this is why we all let off a bit of steam occasionally, right? <laughs> because we're just letting the pressure go just a bit. What we need to do is have a zero tolerance for pain, for our own pain. In other words, feel everything, every pain within your own body, every emotional pain within you. Let yourself feel it and don't tolerate any level of pain within your body before you feel. Does that make sense? Allow yourself to feel the pains you have emotionally and otherwise. Now, how do we get the fear down? So let's say the fear's up there and the pain's here at five. We're only going to deal when the fear goes down, don't we? How do we get the fear down? By addressing the truth. Or telling yourself the truth. Yeah, that's how we do it. That person hurt me 10 years ago. Yeah. And they're going to hurt me now? No. They're, they're, well, sometimes they might. They might. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. Yeah, now, but the truth might. is... <laughs> the truth they is have to do it again. They won't, they won't do that same hurt. Well, the truth is that somebody may keep hurting you over and over again until you deal with that emotion. Does that make sense? So the key is to not... When I say tell yourself the truth, remember some things about truth. Truth is always emotional. What? <laughs> Do you understand what I mean by that? No? Can you feel it? Soul truth. 
anything, remember the soul is your emotions, your passions, your desires, your longings, right? That's your soul. So for truth to enter your soul, the truth has to be passions, desires, longings, emotions. Does that make sense? Mm. Truth isn't intellectual. Truth is emotional, for a start. Error is also emotional, by the way. Errors are within you emotionally. Does that make sense? And truth will get in you only when you feel emotions. Only when you feel, the, a lot of times, the emotions of error which oppose the truth. Yeah. The truth is always going to be emotional. You are not going to be able to think your way through truth. Right? The truth will enter your soul as an emotion. To give you an example of that. How many of you know there's a spirit world? Like, you do feel there's a spirit world. Okay. How many of you cry when somebody dies? <laughs> now, if you put your hand up for both of those things, <coughs> you don't really feel there's a spirit world. Does that make sense? The truth hasn't hit you emotionally yet. Does that make sense? But even if you're human and the loss of that person here, even though you know they're gone to the spirit world, that still you can't still feel pain from that. Why would you feel pain? Because you know that for the rest of your life, when you're here, there, you will not see them again. But that's not true. Why well, you're here on earth. But that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's a truth you believe still, but it's not true. Well, I believe in the spirit world, but I also have lost people who I'm so sad that I still hold sadness, even though I know they're there. Yeah, but you think of them as there. You don't think of them as right next to you. No. So who can talk to you? Does that make sense? Yeah. You, and that is a, that is a falsehood. Your belief is false. They, they are, many of them have tried to talk to you since they've passed, mm -hmm. and you just haven't been in the condition to hear. Them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's just that your belief is false. I believe that. You believe that when they're gone, they've left you for good. Um, <coughs> there, right? Uh, well, I I believe that they can speak to people and they can communicate with people, but I can't communicate with them. Okay, so what are you really sad about? That I can't communicate with them. Okay. Yeah. Not that they've gone, because they haven't gone. But I don't have the ability to communicate with them. But you do. Everyone does. Well, <laughs> well I'm not, I mean, I can't. I just but, but can you see you've just listed three untruths? Because I'm making reasons for doing that, because I'm making excuses. Well, no, no, you just listed three things that you believe, emotionally believe, that are not true. So, so for instance, you said, you said that you can't speak with them. Right. So, I can't speak with... Yeah, that is an untruth. You can speak to them. In fact, the instant you do, they'll be there listening to you generally. Make sense? Mm -hmm. But you don't believe that? No, I do believe. It's just that I don't feel the connection that if I do speak to them, that they I don't feel it. I guess I feel nothing. That's what I'm saying. You don't feel it yet, see? So you think it, but you don't feel it yet. Because you don't feel it yet, it's not true yet. Does that make sense? It's only going to be true when you feel it. But I can speak to them. Yes. When you can speak to them and you feel that you can speak to them, then, when you speak to them, you'll know they're there with you. Or feel that they can hear me. Yes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, while you have, and this is a problem with a lot of our beliefs, right? They are here, but not here. And that we know the truth here, we think we know it, but we still have all these emotional reactions because the truth is not here yet. Does that make sense? So, while you do believe in the spirit world, is that truth here within you, do you think? Do you feel that truth then? Go by your feelings, not by what I'm saying. What are your feelings? Well, I mean, what you're asking me if I believe that... There's a spirit world? Yes. Okay, and you feel that with your whole soul? Oh, yeah. Are you afraid of dying? No. Because of that belief? Right. Does that make sense? Well, it does make sense. Yeah. Now, let's go one step further. Can they talk to you? I believe they could if I could hear them, but I can't. And because I, within myself, don't know, have the ability to hear them. So you don't believe you can hear them? Well, I, <laughs> I believe people can. And I but not you? Because I, I feel like I'm blocked to yeah. where I can't hear them. Okay. And something inside me doesn't allow me to hear them. 
Yep, but many of them are just right by you waiting to talk to you. Well, I'm sure they are. It's just that I can't hear them. Okay. Because I'm too, I block too. I, when I see people that I have a lot of respect for them and all the things that, wow, I'm so great. I wish I could do that, but I can't because I'm blocked to be able to say I can hear you. Okay. So what's the feeling inside of you? The feeling is they can't talk to me. There's something wrong with me. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? What's wrong? I feel like this. I'm insufficient. There's something wrong with me. Other people can do it, but I can't. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the emotion. And that's the grief you feel. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when someone passes, the grief you're feeling is not for their passing, but the fact that you can't hear them anymore, you can't interact with them anymore. That's the feeling you have inside. Mm -hmm. Now that feeling needs to be released. So how do you feel when you can't? interact with somebody anymore who you love. Sad. Sad. Grief. So let yourself cry that grief right the way out, but there will need to be a truth that you accept, and that is that you can actually speak to them, and they can hear you, and they can speak back to you, and once you develop yourself in such a way, you'll be able to also hear them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Once you feel that truth inside of yourself, you will actually do it. You will actually hear them. But before then, you won't hear them until you feel that truth within yourself. I'm, I'm just, the law of attraction is, is that we are always getting exactly what we truly desire. And, and, and it's about free will. So there's no there's such thing as can't. And, and it's always somewhere we don't really want it. So when you say, I can't. when you say, I wish that I could do that, your soul does not want to at this point, is the truth. And the truth is, you do not have a true desire to do so. Because in the law of attraction means that everything that we truly desire, we get. That's how powerful our soul is. So on some level, you do not want, you do not have a true desire to do that. So it's not about can't. There's no can't in, in God's... But, because the law of attraction means that we're always getting. So your soul and your no, 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 I'm not confused. Yeah. So your soul and your material body are fight, can fight against each other. So I could say as a material body that this is what I want, but my soul says no, you're not ready for that. Is that what you're no, saying? No, 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 it's not like that. There's a feeling in your soul that says, "I'm not ready for that," or "I can't do that." Right. It's not a choice that your soul. Well, it is a choice your soul is making, but it's not something where your soul is choosing to do it because you're not mm -hmm. ready yet. It's because your soul is doing it because there's a desire in your soul that's opposite to that. So there's a feeling in your soul at the moment like, I'm unworthy to be talked to by my spirit friends. I'm unworthy to have this gift of communication. Does that make sense? There's that feeling is inside your soul. When you release that feeling from within inside your soul, the attraction will be different. But the feeling at the moment, you think about your, you're just this antenna saying, like, my friends who have passed, I can't talk to you anymore. You know, I'm, what, what's the feeling inside? I can't speak to them. Why can't you speak to them? I can't hear, I can't hear, I can't hear, I can't hear. And while you're feeling this, this is a feeling, not a thought. This is a feeling. Here, you would love to. Right? But here, the feeling inside is I can't. Does that make sense? Once that feeling comes out, which is only going to come out by your experiencing it completely, right? then you'll find you'll move into the state of where you feel you can. Yeah. And you'll look forward to the whole process rather than... There might also be some fears that you have as a result of saying, I'm afraid of doing it. Mm -hmm. right? There's all sorts of things that cause these things to happen, isn't it? Well, I have a comment. Like for me, I, I can hear them I know that. Yeah. I can feel it because I heard it before. Yeah. I felt it before, but it's good. The Jesus out of it. So <laughs> bad. Like, I don't hear it without him. Exactly. Right at this point. At that point. Yeah. Because, like you said, that the emotion that's in you, it got in there through an emotion, and that emotion literally had me like, oh God, it just happened, you know, like, yeah. you know, that frightened me. So, it has to come up again through an emotion. So it could be something that happened, something you heard someone say or whatever, that would cause you to fear to that point where you just block it and you just don't want to say what it is. Yeah. So in Samara's case, she knows that she can do it, but she's so afraid mm -hmm. because of some fearful experiences that she's had. 
whispers. She's so afraid that, that that's just turning the whole thing off. So the truth is that the feeling Sadara needs to do with is fear. Does that make sense? And the truth is that she has this fear because she doesn't recognize the truth yet inside of herself about spirits. That she can look after herself, that they're not going to be able to harm her if she's in a condition of love, they're not going to be able to harm her and so forth. She doesn't believe that yet inside of her soul. Does that make sense? It's just a thought. That, like Sarah knows this in her mind, but in her soul feels something totally different. And often you will feel something totally different than what's in your mind. The lady who's being abused in a relationship, do you think she says in her mind, I want to be abused, I want to be abused, I want to be abused? What is she saying in her mind? I don't want to be abused, I want to be loved, I don't want to be abused, why am I getting this abuse, what's wrong? Does that make sense? That's what she's saying in her mind, but what she's saying in her soul? In her soul there's this feeling of, Abuse me, abuse me, abuse me. Does that make sense? And while that feeling is in the soul, that's what she's going to get. Yeah? Does that make sense? That's the law of attraction at work. So, getting back to that point, the truth is always emotional. When the truth enters you as an emotion, that's from that moment on it's real. It becomes a real, it becomes reality. If the truth is just a thought, it doesn't become reality. So if I have a, think, a thought inside of my mind saying, there is a spirit world, but inside of my heart I have a feeling, I don't have that feeling there is one, does that make sense? Then I'm going to be afraid of dying until that feeling enters my heart. And the only reason why a feeling generally doesn't enter your heart is because you've got an opposite feeling sitting in there saying, you know, when you're dead, you're not, you know, you're lost, you're gone for good. There's all of those feelings, does that make sense, that are in there. And they need to come out. So with all truth, it's the same. Truth is always emotional. Yeah. Yeah. So you understand what I mean by that? Now when I say the truth is always emotional, it's when it becomes an emotion within yourself, that's when it becomes real. So it's, um, I mean... I can see that it is an experience. I mean, it's experiential, but like truth is emotion. I mean, is it? It's truth is emotion. You know, you said it's like yes, it's experiential, but in its pureness, it's emotion. That doesn't, you know, doesn't. I mean, couldn't there be another possibility? <laughs> yeah. Why do you want there to be another possibility? I don't know. Somehow, it just doesn't quite feel right to me. You know, I mean, it's like yes, I agree that. The, that you experience truth through your emotions. That makes perfect sense, no yeah. problem there, but truth itself, just this beautiful truth that's truth. So isn't it beyond emotion? Isn't it beyond emotion? Yeah. Um, where does all truth come from? Well, I think the jury's still out. <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess God, if you, you can use a lot of terms to say God, you could say uh, Buddha or, you know, Whatever. I mean, to me, it all comes from the same place. My definition of God and yours are different. Right? Mm -hmm. God is a being. <coughs> is a what? A being. Yeah. The source of all creation. She created you in her image, in fact. Mm -hmm. She is also soul. When I say soul, she is made of similar things than we ourselves, because we are made in her image. Right? Now, the similar things are the emotions. What is love? Love is an emotion, is it not? Human love is an emotion. <laughs> so why can't God's love be God's emotion of love? Well, I'm certainly open to that idea. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So that, let's, say, let's say we look at love. When we look at, say, divine love in this case, mm -hmm. in other words, the love that belongs to God, isn't that an emotion of God's? How would we know that? Just how we know that you, love for you is an emotion of yours. Remember, we're made in God's image, so we can look at ourselves in a lot of ways and how what happens within ourselves, and we can make certain valid assumptions right, in terms of coming towards truth that God has. Mm -hmm. One of them is that you can't have an emotion 
that God hasn't already, doesn't already know about. Yeah, or has I, not I already created that. So it inc- he inc- to me, God, he, she, it, God, yeah. includes that and transcends that. This just that feels right to me. Yeah, well, God is far bigger than man. Of yeah, course. that's why I was saying to say truth is emotion. Like really, doesn't it include emotion and tra- and, tra- and transcend emotion? Um, sort of include and transcend emotion. All of my experience has been that truth never comes to you except through an emotional process, and it always right, is right. an emotion. I I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. It's an experience, and we do experience that through our emotions. I, I guess I'm just hung up a little bit on saying truth is like I, I like truth is experiential through our emotions. That's how we experience truth is through our emotions. Well, I'm saying is, truth is. is always emotional. Okay, like for us humans. No, for God as well. Mm. And you don't have to agree with that, but. I know from my own experience. I don't know if I disagree. I I just don't know if I agree. If you don't agree, I'm sure you disagree. (laughs) (laughs) You can be open to the possibility. You like you don't you don't have to take sides. You can just say. um, But see now you're going intellectually down, right? I can feel it. I can feel it. Let's go emotional. Yeah, but I feel it. So it's so big. Truth is so big. Oh, truth is. Yeah. God's truth, what I call divine truth. Is one of the most important things in the universe aside from divine love. But but I, what I have learned is that truth is always loving, and therefore truth is always emotional. Because love is emotion. We may be talking about the same thing. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I think sometimes it can be definitions. Yeah, semantics. Yeah. Semantics. Yeah. But truth, truth will never enter your soul without there being an emotion. I, I believe emotion. that. I believe that. And of, and also, God has a lot of emotions, and one of those emotions is the biggest emotion of the universe, which is divine love. And that emotion can also enter you. So love can enter you. God's love can enter you. But that's also going to be an emotional experience. Yes, I believe that. That's okay. not where I think, yeah. yeah. So the way I see it is that love is always emotional. And truth is always emotional. And in fact, if truth, if, if you think a truth, you can know a truth with your mind, right. but ne- will never make it real. Yeah, you can't learn about it in a book. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Once it becomes emotional, now right. it will be real. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. 100%. So, to me, then, the truth is always emotional as a result of that. And if, in fact, you're trying to intellectualize truth, you will never, ever get to the state where you feel it if you're trying to intellectualize it all the time. It just feels so much bigger than... than and emotion. I... Well, to me, to me, truth is one of God's emotions. And God's emotions are infinite. So... And God's emotions are infinite, so they're huge. And that's, I'm certainly not saying that it's my emotion, because my emotions are relative. All of my emotions, right. including my right. emotion of truth, is relative. Does that make sense? So I will never, ever be in a state of absolute truth. Just like I will never, ever be in a state of absolute divine love. Because if I was, I'd be God already. Does that make sense? And I'm not God already. And I know I'm not. Because I can feel it or not. <laughs> Does that make sense? Now, there's a lot of people today say, I am God, right? You're God, I'm God, the chair is God, and all those kind of things. But I can't agree. <coughs> because in the end, I know there is a being from whom I'm receiving divine love, and that being is outside of me. And the, the more and more... What I've found, the more and more I've progressed in divine love, the more I've understood about God's soul, about the being who created me. And that being isn't Buddha or, or Jesus or any uh, other being. But, but just 
different people call it being different names. Yeah. I realize that, but um, I'm talking about the universal creator. I'm talking about the, the being that made the entire universe and that exists, the, existed before the universe was made. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. As did that being's love and as did that being's truth exist before them too. Yeah. Does that make sense? Sort of? No? No, yeah, I mean, I actually think we're maybe talking about the same thing. Yeah. Just, um, yeah. So what's the feeling inside of you? Oh, um, well, I'll just have to sit with it. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. what I've found is that there is, when you receive divine love, into your soul, firstly it is an emotional experience and you feel it and you also feel it throughout your body as well. Right. When you get into a state of disharmony with truth, that flow of love stops. Does that make sense? So truth is actually always going to be related to love and you, you at some stage need to come into a further harmony with truth if you want to continue to receive love. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, it's the same in a relationship in a way relationship with anybody. How can you truly love someone if you don't know anything about them? Or how can you truly love them if you're lying to them or they're lying to you? That's not possible. Right? So if I'm in a state of lying to myself, then I can no longer receive love from God. If I'm in that state. I'll need to bring myself into harmony with truth, God's truth, not my own if I want to continue receiving love from God. Now, I'm not saying that love isn't available. I'm saying I'm talking about the personal relationship between you and God. That will not continue to grow until you're in a state of truth when it comes to God as well. Does that make sense? Lots of people on earth today believe that you can receive love without being in harmony with truth. Most people in their relationships believe this, right? They withhold things from their partner all the time, right? And yet, when they're asked, do you love your partner? Yes, I do. But is that true? If you're withholding things from the partner, what, does love have any fear? No. So if you're withholding things from your partner, why would you be doing that? <coughs> Wouldn't it be based on a fear? So if you're in a state of fear, can you be in harmony with love? And if you're in a state, if state of fear, are you in harmony with truth? No. So love and truth are very much interwoven with each other. Yeah. You cannot expect or even think of yourself, in a way, to be in harmony with love if you're willing to distort the truth. Yeah. And this applies to every relationship that we have, including the relationship with God. Truth is very important, and truth in that's why I made this statement that truth is always emotional. I also say that this at times is always loving. But when I don't think people feel that way. I know people don't feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't feel that way. Right? Most people think that oh, to be loving means that you sort of what, what little white lies are loving, aren't they? That's how most people feel, isn't it? But what's the cause of a little white lie? Isn't it fear? <laughs> isn't it afraid that they'll reject you, or you, you know, they'll think you're rejecting them, or they'll think you know this? Are you protecting them from pain? I'm protecting them from whatever. You know, isn't that all fear? All of it. So therefore, the truth is always loving. When you tell the truth, you're always loving. If you want to come to God, and this is what really what we're here for, is to talk about the connection that we have with God. If you want to have a connection with God in the end, you are going to need to learn some basic things, principles about truth, and one of them is that truth is always loving. It's always loving to tell the truth, and it's in fact always loving to live in harmony with truth. But if we do that, then they don't talk to you anymore. No, this, that's, a, that's called fear. Of, that's not happening. <laughs> that's fear. Mm -hmm. 
if you, you think about it, if you've got to modify your relationship by lying, then is there really love between you and that person anyway? Yeah. Would love, like, would love do that, and would love even want that? What, what do you feel? No. Do you think love would want it? Would love want me? Would I want to lie to you if I loved you? Yeah. Would I want you to lie to me if I loved you? Depends how much fear you have, I guess. I agree, but is fear in harmony with love? No. No. But you can have degrees of, of, of fear and degrees of love at the same time. Is that, is that the way that we are living? It seems like I'm talking about love from God's perspective. Because in the end, this is what I'm promoting, is being at one with God, right? So I'm saying to you, if you want to be at one with God, at some point in the future, you will be in a state of complete truth with absolute if they're in harmony with love, it will all work out fine. But act on those on that basis. So you know that desire you have to tell the person what you feel they've done wrong, mm -hmm. or you know what's going wrong in the relationship. Honestly, a lot of times, how many times have you told somebody something, and then the next day they do it again, mm -hmm. the next day they do it again, the next day they do it again? Why? There you go. Firstly, probably they already know what they're doing. Secondly, if they don't already know, they obviously don't care. And how are you going to make them care? How are you even... And I, I'm not, it's not even about making them care even, really, in the, in the end, is it? It's about you staying in the state of truth about what you feel yourself. You don't have to make them do anything. All you need to do is act in harmony with love yourself and just see what happens. It's not loving them continually if you put up with them being treated bad and giving the person chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. God does not do this. God doesn't snap you up when you make a mistake and take you away from the consequences of your actions, does she? You always experience the consequences of your actions at the soul level. So why do you do that with others or even yourself? Does that make sense? It's because we're not treating ourselves lovingly or others lovingly. Every time we do that, we will hurt. Any time you hurt, it's not love that's hurting. Because in love, when you're in harmony with love, nothing hurts. God does not hurt. Does that make sense? It does, but it hurts even more to leave. Well, like... It's in harmony, in disharmony with love. <coughs> There's a feeling and emotion within you, Alison, mm -hmm. that's in disharmony with love. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to sacrifice yourself and let yourself hurt because it's going to hurt even more if you leave, then both conditions are in disharmony with love. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And it's just a matter why are you avoiding one hurt over the other because one pain is greater than the other. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. And do you think when you're in harmony with love, you'll feel any pain? No, you won't. Does that make sense? Now, it hurts sometimes to even think that, right? <laughs> to even contemplate that idea. But it is a truth. God, God does not hurt. God always deals with us lovingly, and yet... So, think about what God does with you, and do the same. God doesn't, God's not in your ear 24 by 7 saying, don't do this, do that, do this, do that, don't do this, do that. Is she? What is she doing with you? She's letting you make a choice, right? You can choose to listen to her or choose to ignore, doesn't matter. What you choose, she's happy. Right? Obviously, obviously God doesn't punish us or, or, do, or keep cleaning up all our messes or no. doing things out of anger or, or things like that. Obviously, if we're feeling anger when we're trying to do something to teach somebody else a lesson, then, then there's an emotion. Harmony with, disharmony with love too. <laughs> Does that make sense? So if I'm feeling angry, I need to first go away, deal with my anger, then come back and deal with the situation after the anger's all gone. Yeah? Because if I'm angry, I'm in disharmony with love already. Yeah? So God doesn't feel that either. Does that make sense? Now these, I know this all might sound like way out there, like, but this is all possible, living here on earth, this is all possible. You can be in this state. 
it just takes some learning about love. You see, what happens a lot is that we have so many distorted views about love. Let's call them uh, love, in quotations, distortions. Or you could call them love errors, right? <coughs> we actually believe this love that we have to be true. But if the love, if the results are through the law of attraction, if the love hurts, then what does that tell us? It's not true love. It's not true love. There's something about love I'm not getting. Does that make sense? Now, just to give you an illustration of my own life, there was this lady in my life for, <coughs> for a period of seven years. <coughs> I spent one day every month with her for the first three years. So I put up with her wanting to not be with me for 29 or 30 days of the month and just coming and visiting me one day a month. Right. And after she left, every time I'd have a big cry and I'd write and type on my computer all the things about you know how I was feeling and all that kind of stuff, I was hurting heaps, right? So. Why, what was I doing? I was believing something about love that wasn't true. Love wouldn't have done that. Does that make sense? Once I, after seven years of this, this she left me during this relationship probably 40 times, maybe a bit more. Right? So she left me and I went through these terrible emotions 30 or 40 times, real huge emotions of rejection and loneliness and all of those emotions, right? Now, it hurt me tremendously. Does that make sense? Emotionally, that's how it felt for me. Then I, then I had this realisation one day. I was wanting the wrong person to love me. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> very <right. laughs> now, I know it sounds like a basic thing, right? But it took, wow. me, seven, it took me seven years to get, right? Now, now, the distortion I had within myself was that love would continue putting up with all of this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That love hopes, and this, this viewpoint, that love hopes is a, is a big viewpoint on earth today. But, but the truth is that love was, love was hurting me, so therefore there was something that I needed to learn about love that I didn't know. And what it turned out being was firstly, I wasn't choosing God to love me. I wasn't choosing someone who could love me to love me. I was choosing someone who couldn't love me to love me. And when you do that, you're going to hurt. Does that make sense? Because they're never going to be able to love you until they make a decision to do something about it, which may be never, right? And in the end, what's going to happen is I'm going to hurt over and over and over and over again until I get the truth that I need to focus love on someone who can love me, not on someone who can't. Right now, who can't, right now. Now, the way I viewed it in my mind was, oh, this girl's a wonderful girl, and sooner or later, if I do the right thing and I say the right things and I help her with her emotions, and, and particularly in, the, in the, my case, I was focused on trying to help her with her emotions and so forth, right? To, to eventually <coughs> to love me, right? Doing all of these things. The more that happened, the more she left. And she could cheat on me and leave, and I was fine with that. When I said fine with it, I had to cry for a month or two, right? But I would still accept it back again. Right? Over and over again. Now, why would I do that? Because I had a distortion, a deep distortion in my own soul about what love was. <laughs> You'd rather rewrite than I agree. Well, yeah, yeah. And um, not, only, not only that, I wasn't even right. <laughs> right, because you think you're right. I thought what I was doing was love, but it wasn't. It wasn't love at all. Because love doesn't hurt. And then once I understood that, does God hurt? No. <laughs> you know, this is what went through my mind eventually. Eventually, when I say it, seven years later, right? And does God hurt? Is God always loving? Yes. Does God hurt? No. Why doesn't God hurt?
when you love someone and they don't return your love, how do you feel? Rejected. Rejected and hurt. Right? Why doesn't God feel that? Well, no, because God doesn't want the love of somebody who doesn't want to love God. Does that make sense? God doesn't want the love of somebody who doesn't want to love God. God so he doesn't love atheists? No, no. He does. God he does doesn't want, want the love of an atheist when the atheist chooses to not love God. Does that make sense? When the atheist chooses to love God, then God wants their love. Does that make sense? This is one thing about the truth about love. Love does not want the other person. The love, what love wants is for the other person to exercise their free will. This is what God wants. God wants you to exercise your free will. So if you don't want to love God, then God's happy with that. God doesn't get sad about that. Because if God got sad about that, there'd be six billion people making God's <laughs> Maybe not that many, but quite a lot. Hey? When you add up all the people in the spirit world who don't want God, and the people on earth who don't want God, there'd be a lot of unhappiness for God. If God was unhappy. Right? God would be one depressed, constant crying God. <laughs> That's not what God's like, right? So if I believe that love hurts, and I did believe that love hurts, that was a belief within my soul, I had to release that emotion. It took seven years of hurting for me to release that emotion. Does that make sense? Was it your law of attraction that was bringing her Totally, back? totally. She would, it would bring her back every time. Right? Because she was the ideal person. <laughs> to trigger something you weren't doing. That's right. Perfect. She was the perfect. And I look at her now, and I, I feel a lot of love towards her, because she was the ideal person to actually trigger all of my injuries about love. I have a question. You keep calling God she. And is God a she, or is God a she, he? And <laughs> I call God my mother or my father. Does that make sense? Like, so Why do you refer to God as she on that phone? And because some people here are challenged by the idea of God being she, so I usually say what challenges people. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it's basically what I mean. Maybe we can understand it, but is it more of an androgynous state? No, 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 no. Or equal that thing we don't even understand. <laughs> God doesn't have gender in that way, but God does have masculine and feminine qualities. And if you have an injury on one side or the other, you will have an injury with God too. So for instance, let's say a person on earth dislikes their mother, then they are actually going to have the problem of connecting with the feminine side of God. If a person on earth dislikes men, they're going to have a problem connecting with the masculine side of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I will use the terms mother <coughs> interchangeably. Historically, I've used the term father a lot um, because I wanted people to understand that uh, God cares for his children just like a father would care for his children. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of fathers don't seem to care for their children very much. And, and so a lot of times I'll interchangeably use those two terms. Mm -hmm. To me, it, it's about a personal relationship with God. All of this is about a personal relationship with God. Not, not seeing God as some far off sort of nebulous being that I can't connect with. But rather, you will, you will find that you will actually be able to have a d deeply personal relationship with God. Not in a religious sense either, uh, that you know, religions portray, but like a one on one relationship like every other one on one relationship you have. Does that make sense? And that's why I refer to God as my mother or father, or she or he. Yeah. Just she or mine. <laughs> well, I must have a feeling about she tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times it is he and our father. So there's been other people who've listened to me talk and they know that I often use the term father. And the real term. Well, I think you've heard enough from me tonight. <laughs> Uh, hopefully that's been informative or at least uh, challenging. <laughs> <laughs> and now, with regard to, I've got some CDs here. If you want to 
learn more about the divine love part. I've divided the contents of the CD, love, love free. So I've divided the contents of the CD into two directories. One is called natural love and one past called divine love. In the divine love section, there's about, uh, about 10,000 pages of channeled information about the divine love path, if you like, of progression. And there's about four or five thousand pages of, of information on the natural love path of progression. Yeah. So um, when I say natural love, I'm talking about the love you have inside of yourself without God. Right. When I'm talking about divine love, I'm talking about God's love that he has with inside himself that can be for you if you want it. Make sense? So, and both of those are on, on the CD. There's lots of information available if you, if you want. So that's the end of that. Thank you. Um, is there some cutter or eats? Or yeah, we have you know, some snacks left and if, if there's coffee going, if anybody wants tea, we can start that. But um, there's refreshments still up. Anybody wants cake? It's cake. <laughs> there's just one thing I'd like to say. There's some spirits here who've been lining up wanting to ask questions, um, and maybe we can deal with their questions tomorrow or, or the next day. So if they'd be happy to return, we can talk to them specifically about their particular questions. And so we'll that, up. that often happens where there's lots of spirits here who want to ask questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Roger. <laughs>